Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon and welcome to this event organized by UCOPE, the European Confederation of Pharmaceutical Entrepreneurs. Um, this event organized by UCOPE uh, is called the future of rare diseases in Europe and Czech Republic. What are the solutions at EU and national level? Uh, UCOPE is a small biotech uh, uh, mid-sized biotech trade associations. There's also larger companies, part of the membership. Many of the organizations specializes in rare disease, and this is why we want to focus this event today on rare disease specifically. My name is Antoine Mial, uh, and I'm delighted to be today the moderator of this uh, 90 minutes event. So during this 90 minutes roundtable, we want to discuss some of the most exciting topics that uh, will be debated at European level on health. And, and before we get to the uh, content of the event, let me remind you a few, uh, a few important elements. First of all, this event is being recorded uh, and we will go through uh, first opening remarks, then a panel discussions, and finally a Q&A. If you would like to post questions, please do so. You can do, the, do so in the, uh, in the uh, question functions, in the chat function, and the Q&A function of the uh, Zoom platform. But let me now get to the event per se. Um, so never ever, we've seen so much activity going on at EU level with regard to health. Of course, we're just coming out, hopefully coming out of the uh, one of the worst pandemic uh, Europe uh, faced. Um, and we've seen a lot of activities taking place, uh, you know, at EU level, especially to, you know, avoid and tackle future pandemics. But remember that just a few years ago, the European Commission had opened its mandate with a very strong health agenda, started with the cancer Cancer plan uh, and the cancer mission, uh, which were you know big endeavors from the from the EU, but we've also seen a number of new uh, proposals you know coming out or you know being revised. First of all, the European Health Data Space that has been published a few weeks ago and is being debated now uh, quite uh, intensely by uh, different stakeholders, but also the long-awaited pharmaceutical strategy and the orphan drugs revision. Uh, I mean, these two pieces are really important and uh, will basically come uh, to fruition in the uh, coming month during the uh, Czech presidency of the EU, which is about to kick off in, in July. And this is what we really want to focus today during this event. Uh, and let me explain you why. Uh, in 2000, uh, the EU passed a legislation called the OMP, the Orphan Medicinal Products Legislation. And, and this this legislation was about, you know, creating new incentives primarily for uh, companies developing rare uh, disease uh, medicines for uh, rare disease patients across Europe and beyond. Um, what we've seen uh, 20 years down the road is that this legislation had had a massive impact on, uh, you know, rare disease treatments with the development of uh, therapies in disease that were before not treated. So there has been a lot of benefits uh, from this legislation. Still, you know, 20 years down the road, 95% of all Europeans with rare disease do not have any treatment options. Um, and this is purely because there's no therapies uh, in these, uh, for these indications for these diseases. So there is undoubtedly much more that needs to be done uh, to address the needs uh, and meet the needs of patients affected by rare disease in Europe. And the, the reopening of the legislation is an opportunity to do so. Um, and we're very keen, of course, to you know, have this discussion and, and, and debate about you know, what needs to be done. Um, uh, this review, as I said, doesn't come alone. It comes together with the pharmaceutical strategy uh, and the pharmaceutical review, um, um, which is a, a huge endeavor by the EU that has been on the agenda for a couple of years. And it's interesting because the two files are coming together while the uh, Czech presidency is about to kick off. Uh, so both will be heavily debated. And so this is why we wanted to have this, this debate ahead of the uh, start of the presidency. So really thanks for everyone for joining and especially to our uh, Czech panelists that I will introduce in a few minutes. Um, just, I wanted to say that this event doesn't just want to focus on EU legislations. Uh, we also see some very interesting actions taking place at country level. In Czech Republic, for example, a law was adopted a year ago, uh, especially focusing on rare diseases, which 
the aim to improve access to, to treatments for rare disease patients. So we're very keen to learn from our, our speakers today about you know, what was this legislation about and what we can learn from this. Uh, are there some good lessons we can retrieve from it for the EU um, uh, debates that are coming up? Uh, there's a lot of other questions we would like to tackle. You know, um, basically, an essential one is, you know, how do we balance innovation with access, right? And how can we, you know, improve on one side, uh, you know, access to treatments while not, you know, uh, endangering innovation? Uh, we also want to to discuss, you know, the 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 the, the remit uh, of the EU of the member states and what can be done by who. Uh, basically. So to address and respond and debates uh, or ans try to answer to some of these questions, I'm really delighted to welcome our, our panelists and speakers. Um, and so we will have with us today uh, Jakub Dvoracek. He's the De Deputy Minister of Health. And sorry for mispronouncing your name, uh, Jakub. I hope I did. I really did my best. Um, uh, we will have Anna Arelanasova, Chairperson, Rare Disease Czech Republic. Uh, Pavla Dolitsalova, she's a doctor uh, at the General University Hospital in Prague. Leona Perinova, CEE lead at SOBI. And uh, also with me, Vittoria Carraro, who is from UCOPE and will uh, uh, share the closing remarks. But before we close, let's open, right? And let's start with you, Oliver. Uh, Oliver Sudo, you're the deputy section of UCOPE, and we would like to hear from you a uh, couple of opening remarks to this event. The floor is yours, Oliver. Thank you very much, Antoine. Um, I hope you can hear me because I have some um, just receive the message that my internet connection is unstable, uh, but I'll try my best. So minister, ladies and gentlemen, also from my side, a very warm welcome to this round table on how we want to tackle rare diseases in the Czech Republic and across Europe um, in the future. Um, thank you very much for uh, the introduction. My name is Oliver Zude. Uh, um, and I'm indeed, as Antoine said, the Deputy Secretary General of UCOB and a lawyer by training. Um, so this makes it particularly interesting for me to look into uh, new pieces of legislation. Uh, UCOB has been organizing a series of events on rare diseases over the past month to bridge the perspective of national and EU stakeholders on the future of how we want to further improve the treatment of patients with rare diseases, and obviously also the development of the necessary drugs in Europe. And so it is indeed with great pleasure that today we come together with experts from the Czech Republic, not only against the background of the upcoming presidency of the EU, but also since, um, as Antoine mentioned, the Czech Republic recently adopted national legislation that established pathways to orphan drugs. And while the full impact um, of this new legislation is yet to be seen, it is definitely a crucial moment to look at the interplay between what can and must be done at national level and what can and must be done at EU level for patients with rare diseases, but also for developers of their treatments. These are topics that are obviously very close to our heart here um, with UCOPE. Um, for more than a decade, UCOPE is the voice of small to mid-sized companies in Europe. We have around 140 members, and I'd say around 50% of the manufacturers um, in our membership are develop, developing treatments for rare diseases. So why are we here today? And I think uh, Antoine, you captured it uh, very well. Um, on the one hand, we are looking back uh, 22 years um, when the so-called OMP regulation was adopted um, by the European legislators. Um, their ambition was to stimulate the development of new medicines for the treatment of rare diseases. And obviously, 22 years later, the question is, 
did Europe manage to get more investments and more treatments approved for patients with rare diseases? And um, for once, I think um, the answer is simple. Yes, we are seeing a significant increase, or we have been seeing a significant increase in orphan medicines on the EU market. Uh, right now, we have around 200 orphan medicines authorized by the European Medicines Agency and some or um, very rare diseases or ultra rare diseases. So this is indeed a success. But, and Antoine, you mentioned um, the figures, um, it covers around 5% of the known um, rare conditions so far. So there is much more to do. So um, when we are looking at the ongoing revision of this piece, um, of legislation of the OMP regulation. Um, we believe that um, the future of the OMP regulation, the updated OMP regulation, should build um, on the success of the current system. So um, that this legislative process actually results in an improvement, and the improvement has been defined. There is way more to do to tackle the remaining um, 95 percent. But uh, obviously we also need to acknowledge that unmet medical needs in rare diseases cannot be addressed by means of this revision of the EU-wide harmonized framework alone, but it also depends on member states' policies in this field. Um, as far as um, this first part is concerned, the review of the OMP regulation. Let me just stress that um, it is important for you, Cope, uh, that it is accepted that there's a difference between tailoring incentives and simply reducing them. And um, it also needs to be acknowledged that unmet medical need is inherent in all rare diseases. And obviously, um, from an industry association's point of view, predictability for developers um, of rare diseases treatments is absolutely vital. So let's make sure that this revision actually gives the right instruments to tackle all unmet medical needs and to continue the success story of developing these drugs for patients in Europe and improve the system. And um, in, in, in this respect, UCOPE has been engaging with patients, academics, investors, and other stakeholders over the past 12 months um, as a partner of the European Expert Group on Orphan Drug Incentives. Um, this group developed 14 recommendations uh, spanning across the life cycle of rare diseases treatments from research to access, and it's a result of a multidisciplinary work, discussions, debate, and also compromise. And I think this can be a good example, not only for discussions and roundtables like the one we have today, but hopefully also with the um, interaction between the EU legislators later on. Um, from, this, um, from these discussions and from finding this um, consensus amongst this group, it became quite clear that it is not enough to tackle uh, still existing gaps in treatments by the review of the incentives alone, uh, in the OMP regulation alone. But, and uh, I've mentioned it at the beginning, we need sound research policies and coordination of national, of member states, access policies as well. And this brings us back to today's uh, roundtable. We hope this meeting can be an opportunity to advance the discussion of how the national and the EU frameworks uh, should work together and what are the priorities and caveats concerning the OMP regulation. And yeah, we're particularly keen to learn about um, the Czech Republic's view on this topic since the legislative process might very well kick off during uh, the EU presidency of the Czech Republic. So we are particularly honored um, to have the Czech Deputy Minister of Health um, with us today to bring um, us his government's perspective on the upcoming debate. And um, without further ado, I will give the floor to him 
and take the opportunity to wish you all a fruitful debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver, for this uh, introduction and already unpacking some very interesting topics that uh, I, I can't wait to, to really debate with the, with the broader group. Uh, turning now to Jakub, just let me give you a, a few seconds of introduction about yourself, Jakub. So you, you joined the Ministry of Health and just took up the, the role of Deputy Minister for the Czech Republic uh, Presidency of the EU. So really a key role there. You started in February uh, but you're not new to the uh, to the files. Huh? You've been executive director uh, of the associations of innovative pharmaceutical industry since 2011. So you're very well acquainted with uh, some of the issues and challenges. So we, of course, uh, we are very delighted that you made uh, you know the time and space to to join us. Before that, you had different roles. Uh, worked in the investment division in Czech Republic, uh, Czech Invest, uh, the promotion agency um, uh, which is connected to the Ministry of Trade and Industry. So. All also an interesting perspective in terms of, you know, how do you attract investment uh, in, in your country, of course, but in EU more broadly now that uh, you also are uh, taking part of the EU presidency. Uh, and before that, you've been also an advisor to the uh, Minister of Education, Youth and Sport, which is also, of course, a key topic, right? Because education and, you know, growing the next generation of of scientists is also uh, a key connection to the uh, future of the sector. So I'd like to turn to you, Jakob, for a short introduction about the uh, EU presidency, uh, the lens of the Czech Republic, what will be your priorities in health? The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. And Antoine, thank you for the for the nice introduction. I'm very happy to be with you and uh, with your colleagues to, to have a chance to introduce you know, what we are planning for the Czech presidency from the perspective of healthcare, of course. And uh, yeah, I would like to I would like to briefly to, to to just you know try to interconnect with all the things which were already mentioned in here. And then we can come to the list, uh, but the list is already published, you know, by the Czech Ministry of Health, and we had uh, already some press discussions, you know, in the Brussels. So I think a number of you already know, you know, what will be what will be our general focus. But uh, what I would like to mention at the beginning is the is the importance of rare disease, you know, for the Czech uh, Czech Ministry of Health and for our agenda. I mean, during the coming uh, half a year. Uh, it's probably quite well known that, uh, that the Czech, the first Czech presidency was already interconnected uh, with the with the rare disease. Uh, we had the chance to work, you know, on this uh, on this first uh, first uh, uh, regulation, and, and uh, all the time we we worked quite hard uh, at the uh, Czech Republic to think, you know, and to prepare the environment which uh, which helps the people with rare disease to get uh, better access to the treatment. And, I'm, and, and the reason why we are moving uh, quite fast here, and I believe we are doing the steps which, uh, which help the people to, uh, to have a better access, and not just to the treatment itself, but also you know, to the other services, which are, which are also very important for the patients with, uh, patients with rare disease. And the reason is that uh, from the early beginning, uh, we work closely with the, the patient organizations, with the, with the, the Czech Aerodis representation, and I'm happy that, uh, that Anička Aranasova is, uh, is today with us. Uh, I will be the part of uh, the coming discussion, but also with uh, scientific societies. And again, it's a, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Pavel Lezhova joined with us. It will be quite a nice discussion with all the stakeholders who were close to the development which we try to, uh, try to implement here. And as you mentioned, we have a we have a new legislation from from January, so we will see you know how this new legislation, which I believe is quite uh, quite rare because it includes the, the patient organizations and medical scientific societies, not just to the evaluation process but also to the decision making process, which is uh, I believe quite essential to have all partners uh, uh, included in this discussion. And uh, at the end. Uh, you can see it, you know, that we are building on the on the French presidency. We are in trial with French and uh, with France and with, with Sweden, and uh, we really try to to pick up, you know, the most uh, most interesting parts uh, which comes out, you know, during the French presidency. And we believe, you know, we will build a, a nice bridge uh, also to uh, to our colleague from Sweden to continue on the topics which we will not finish it. And if I come generally to the to the uh, to the priorities of Czech Republic in healthcare. Uh, 
is the oncology again uh, close collaboration uh, based on uh, on the, on what was discussed during the, the French press we will definitely try to build uh, and help to move uh, in more detailed uh, implementation of European beating cancer plan and I will come to the, to the details a bit later on but I will not be long don't worry then uh, then the availability of uh, rare disease uh, rare disease treatment this is the second priority on the list, but it's not the second. It's uh, it's just listed, you know, in this way. And I believe, you know, that in this field we will again uh, build on uh, what was started uh, by by French presidency, and it's uh, the push and work with the European Commission to create uh, the similar plan as we as we have it for for cancer. And I believe, you know, if we can do it for cancer, we have to also do it uh, for the rare diseases. And uh, it, was this, it was mentioned here by, by Oliver, uh, the importance uh, for the industry to understand you know, how the research is supposed to look like and uh, how the clinical trials should, uh, should be implemented. And all those very important things uh, uh, for the patients to see that we will come to more and more treatments to those uh, who are still waiting for its own. But it's, what I feel is also the same important, and it will be part of our discussion uh, during the Czech presidency, is the access of patient uh, in the in the Europe, and you can see that in a number of countries uh, you still you still do not have uh, the access at the same time. In some countries, it's quite fast after the registration, centralized registration of rare disease treatment on the on the EMA. But in some countries, you have to wait a long, long, long time, uh, five years, six years, even longer. So again, this will be also discussed. You know how to ensure you know that the patients in some countries. Uh, uh, will not wait, you know, so long time. Uh, but besides of rare diseases, and uh, we will come to the details and we will discuss it with our colleagues uh, later on, we will definitely focus uh, on the vaccination. It's quite uh, quite natural because, I mean, vaccination is a quite an interesting success story for the Europe. And I believe that also for the rare disease, and not just rare, but also the other areas, we can learn, you know, what uh, the Europe did uh, together to... Uh, uh, to uh, have the vac vaccines available for the all Europeans in the very close time. Uh, and uh, it's definitely a lesson, lesson learned and we will build on that. Uh, but also not just on the, on the, from, the from the point of, uh, of uh, uh, procurement or negotiation, but also communication and also, let's say, to have a more to have a more more close uh, all the regulations which comes you know with uh, with COVID nineteen and, and areas around, and then the global health and uh, and let's say the stronger role of EU joint position towards the WHO and a number of other important organizations to have let's say, I wouldn't say one European voice but uh, to be to be close to this uh, to this. And what is also essential for the Czech Ministry of Health, and we will push it uh, through the Czech Presidency, is the area of, uh, of uh, Ukraine. Of course, the Ukraine from uh, from perspective of treatment and support for the refugees which came to the countries like Czech Republic, Poland, a number of others. We know that we have uh, more than 380,000, close to 400,000 uh, refugees, which represent like 4% of population in the Czech Republic now. So to, to have a good care, to have a good uh, and available healthcare services for all those people is something, you know, what is uh, essential for us. And we would like to run a, a strong discussion around the, around the EU, how to ensure that not just the, the classical care, but also the, the mental, mental care and uh, many other areas will be provided in, in highest possible way to those uh, who are in need of, uh, of, uh, of this support. And you mentioned it, uh, uh, Antoine and Oliver, that uh, there will be, you know, the European, European Health Data Space Regulation open, which is now uh, already discussed. It will be our legislative priority number one. We will try to move as far as possible with the uh, discussion, and we believe uh, we will be then able to deliver the progress report on the EBSCO meeting, which comes, uh, which comes uh, at the end of the Czech Presidency, December 9 in Brussels. Uh, then the revision of directive uh, on blood tissues and cells. Again, a very interesting piece of legislation, and I believe it will also resonate in all member states. And uh, it's essential, uh, especially the, the the situation when the Europe is uh, 
is not really uh, self-sufficient in those uh, in, in the treatment based on uh, on uh, on blood and uh, and uh, plasma. So there will be definitely, and I believe, a very interesting discussion in this field. And then we have also the MFEs regulation, uh, which I found out also quite complicated text uh, for discussion and uh, and negotiation. So you can see we have a number of interesting uh, legislative materials. Unfortunately, we will probably only touch the orphan uh, uh, regulation. Uh, it will probably come the late uh, December. So uh, we will not be able to, to uh, let's say, create a good environment for discussion. But I believe our Swedish colleagues will take it, uh, and we will get uh, the chance uh, as a trial to have uh, to have a number of uh, discussions on this field. And I believe, you know, it's uh, it's, uh, it's one of the most important uh, materials uh, for the trial presidency. So this is this is the legislative issues. We would like to then also have some non-legislative uh, proposals and priorities. It will be it will be council conclusion on vaccination. It will be it will be uh, as I mentioned it already very important material for us. Then the council recommendation on cancer screening. Again, the material tree will, will be, we will go on, and and uh, and then uh, I'm coming to the to the uh, ministerial meetings. We will have an informal EBSCO meeting uh, the sixth and seventh of September in Prague. Uh, it will be followed uh, by the discussion on the availability on, of vaccination uh, on COVID-19 and also the discussion on the agreements, uh, which, are, which are now heavily discussed in member states on the supplying of uh, COVID-19 vaccines. And then the EBSCO council meeting, which I already mentioned in December 9 in, uh, in Brussels. So you can see it's, a, it's a quite, a, quite a number of things which, uh, which we, will, we will have to move it forward. And we also preparing uh, uh, a few very important conferences. One I will mention it at the beginning again is the conference on modern cancer controls, and it will be uh, July 13 and 14 in Debeno. Uh, and again, I will just mention it. The goal is to adopt call to action in the field of oncology, and then the rare disease uh, conference towards a new European policy framework, building the future together the 25th and 26th uh, October in Prague. And as I mentioned it, uh, we would like to have uh, the, this, this conference as a ground for further discussion on the plan for rare disease uh, in the Europe, closely with, uh, with all our partners uh, from the patient uh, organizations and medical scientific societies. And I also believe that the industry will contribute on this discussion. Then we prepare the conference on vaccination as access story. I am not sure you know how big success for it, it is, but uh, we will try to really show you know all the lessons learned you know from uh, from that uh, from that uh, area. It will be the November 21 and 22nd in Prague, and again, uh, not just the vaccination itself, but also the communication and uh, the way how the member states deal with this topic. And uh, then we have a number of. Other events, which uh, which is let's say under the under the auspices of the Czech Republic presidency, the new board screening uh, on rare disease, July 23rd in Brno. We will also support the patient group involvement uh, conference of national national uh, patient associations. Then uh, the conference on mental health in November 11, and uh, also the number of others uh, which I will not mention it, but they are you know also very important for us. And we believe that he will fill every day of, uh, of our presidency. Unfortunately, you also know that uh, the country who keeps the presidency at the second half of the year have uh, a bit shorter presidency. In the reality, we will only have uh, like about five uh, or four and a half months because of the August, uh, it's, uh, it's off. And then uh, the Christmas time comes closely. So uh, it will be a bit shorter and we need to fit uh, everything to this short time. So that's all for the interaction from my side, and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to have a discussion in the second part of uh, today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jakub. It's a very heavy agenda.
on a very short, as you said, four and a half uh, month uh, to tackle all these files. Uh, but thank you for giving us this, uh, this overview. And as you said, I think that's really important. It's the continuity between the presidency, right? You said you will work also. You're working already with the French presidency on the OMP, and, and that will, of course, continue with the Swedish presidency. So um, th thank you very much. Uh, I'd like now to turn to um, our first uh, panelist, Pavla, Doletsalova, Professor Pavla, uh, I mean, you're Professor of Pediatrics, uh, Certified Pediatric Rheumatologist, and you're Head of the Center for Pediatric Rheumatology and Autoinflammatory Diseases in the General University Hospital in Prague. Um, uh, and also, I mean, as an eminent scientist, you're also a representative of the European Reference Network called RITA, uh, which focuses on rare immunological disorders. And we're really delighted to, to have you with us uh, to Today and uh, we would really want to hear from you, Pavla. You know how, how in your experience as a doctor, you know what are the some of the challenges you see faced by patients uh, living with rare disease in the Czech Republic? We would be very interested to understand, you know, the landscape uh, in the country and and you know you in your experience as a doctor, you know what kind of challenges you're facing. But thank you very much for being there, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think this is maybe not just the Czech problem. I think that patients with rare diseases share similar problems across EU countries and maybe especially in those countries, uh, so-called Eastern European countries, where the healthcare system has been developing slightly differently and faces maybe somewhat different challenges than established East Western European uh, communities. What I think is the major issue for the patients is actually availability of expert care because for rare diseases, expertise is vital. And the second is access to this expert care. So some countries, especially the smaller countries may not have the expertise locally. They can develop it, but they can sometimes hardly maintain it because without actually having sufficient numbers of patients being treated at the center, you just can't have the appropriate expertise. So international collaboration, even in the clinical care, will be vital for those super rare or extra rare diseases. The other challenges that those patients face would be delay in diagnosis, which is closely connected to the problems with availability and access to care and connected to that and to the treatment which we are discussing uh, at this conference is the delay in therapy onset as well. So these are basically the main challenges from the patient perspective, I guess. Thank, thank you very much. And we will come back to both of them. Uh, that's very enlightening, I think, uh, to, to kick off this, uh, this discussion. I'd like now to turn to uh, Leona, Leona Perinova. Uh, Leona, you're uh, the lead for Center and European uh, Eastern Europe uh, at SOBI. Uh, let me briefly introduce SOBI. Uh, SOBI is a Swedish mid-size biopharmaceutical company that focuses on rare disease. Um, the global head of office is in Stockholm, Sweden, um, and you have presences in over 30 countries um, and you're delivering treatments in over 70 countries uh, worldwide. And your mission is to develop and deliver innovative therapies and services to improve the lives of people living with rare diseases. I think I was looking uh, just before the event, I think Sobi currently has a bit less than 2,000 employees. So it's still a, a, so a size company, but it's not neither uh, one of the large pharmaceutical companies with uh, hundreds uh, of thousands of headcounts. Uh, and Leona, uh, about yourself, you've started in pharma uh, already 20 years ago. So deep expertise there, and you, you work with leading uh, pharmaceutical companies before uh, joining SOBI in 2008, uh, 2018, sorry, first as country manager for Czech Republic. Uh, so very interesting, of course, to have your, your, your return on experience there. And then step by step, you expand it to the CEE region. So now you're covering countries, including Slovakia, Slovenia, Croatia, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary. So in this ever expanding portfolio, we're very interested, of course, to see what's in your view, the dynamics going on in the region. So in your role, Leona, could you uh, describe a little bit the, the landscape in the region, uh, in the CEE region for, for rare disease treatments? 
Definitely, yes. Good, uh, good afternoon to everybody and Antoine, thank you very much uh, for, for this nice uh, introduction. Uh, it's really uh, my privilege to be here and to be part of this discussion, especially if it is uh, related to real diseases. As uh, was already mentioned in uh, CE, uh, we operate in eight EU countries and I would say we face uh, a uh, diverse picture related uh, to various uh, patient access regulation. Yeah. And this somehow, let's say, oscillating uh, from, I would say, clear, sufficient understanding how to solve uh, this uh, rare, ultra rare disease area differently. And I would say with uh, tailor made approach, made or applied. And uh, uh, let's say, intention uh, of continual considerations uh, on improvements. And here I would mention, uh, especially Czech Republic example, where we appreciate uh, that the new legislation somehow reflected also so societal burden of the rare disease. And uh, also on top of this, uh, let's say topic, there is a, a, the possibility of several uh, patient access uh, channels uh, available as well here. And we oscillate to this another side, let's say where we see rather general, general approach uh, with no specialized value assessment framework, which uh, leads, I would say, to higher uh, times uh, uh, for regular reimbursement, uh, which could be up to two years years. And uh, this is due to, I think, uh, missing knowledge, expertise, but also due to unrealistic expectations, especially in this area on clinical data, real world evidence data during uh, these uh, PR procedures. And I would say uh, in the pub public debates related to rare diseases are, uh, let's say, almost uh, invisible in these countries and um, more critical voices uh, from different stakeholders. I would say patient uh, advocacy groups, experts, scientists, policy decision makers are needed uh, to, to improve uh, the rare disease landscape in, this, uh, in these countries. And as I could hear so Professor, uh, Professor Pavla Doležalov, I think that, that we are really, really aligned here. Yeah, that... There is a really need uh, of some uh, of some some debate and and change in this part, especially in our area. Thank you so much, Leona, uh, and very keen to deep dive a bit further into these uh, debates that you think should happen. I'd like now to welcome Anna Areleno Sova. Uh, dear Anna, th thank you so much for for being with us. I know you had. Uh, other meetings and uh, you're just jumping from one to another, but uh, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. Anna, you're the chairperson uh, of Rare Disease Czech Republic. Uh, this uh, association is a member of uh, Eurodis, so you're very familiar with the uh, European landscape and the European work going on at, uh, at the patient organization level uh, in the EU. But also I'd like to highlight, like you've been the, the vice chair of the newly established patient council of the Ministry of Health in um, in Czech Republic. So we are very interested, of course, by, you know, uh, learning from this experience and what it means. You've also participated in the creation of the legislation. So we would really want to, to have your views there on, you know, what has changed or what is expected to change. Um, and, uh, and as I said, you're also part of this working group for rare disease uh, in the Czech Ministry of Health. So, uh, Anna, without further ado, could you describe... Uh, for us, uh, for everyone here in this virtual room, you know how the rare disease patient community is structured in the in the in Czech Republic. Um, you know how how the level of expertise, the level of funding, and relationship with the with the policymakers and key stakeholders in the uh, health systems is is operating. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for that question. I'm honored to be um, here on behalf of all rare disease patients. Uh, it's uh, really an honor. But back to your question. Uh, we have about 120 patient organizations in the Czech Republic, of which I dare to say about 30% represent a rare disease. Um, 
we were um, very fortunate that in 2017, uh, there was a really good political constellation and patient council for the Minister of Health was established. Uh, together with the patient council, about which I'll talk a bit further later, there was a department for patient support, which is a part of the ministry. So it's nothing temporary. It is a, it is a part of the ministerial uh, system, which we really appreciate. The patient council of the health minister is there as an advisor and provider of information on the battlefield, so as to say. We are able to uh, provide our opinion to the minister on the legislation that is being prepared. And that happened also with the legislation we were talking about earlier on the orphan drugs access in the Czech Republic. We are also proud to say that last year, together with the approval of the legislation, we have a definition of a patient organization. It was a big struggle for us, but we do have a definition which was necessary for us to be able to take part in the decision making process within the legislation. The patient organizations. Um, according to the definition, are part of the registry of the patient organizations that are recognized and able to take part in the decision-making process. The other part of the question was, how is the level of expertise? What is the professional level of patient organizations? I'm very proud to say that within, for the last 10 years, we have we have done a big step forward in the professionalization of our organizations, partially thanks to the establishment of the Academy of Patient Organizations, which was run by uh, the Association of Pharma Innovative Pharmaceutical Industry, which helped us a great deal to educate ourselves to become better advocates in our field. That uh, Academy is, is, is a great benefit for all of us to learn everything that is to run a business. It is a nonprofit business, but all in all, we have to run accounting, we have to do PR, we have to do all that, that it takes to run a company. And we have to learn how to be good advocates. We have to know how to uh, read legislation, how to prepare a legislation, how to comment a legislation and so on. The last part was funding. Uh, funding is a big problem and we are trying to solve it as patient organizations by offering a discussion platform um, with the Ministry of Health and other stakeholders to create a funding system that would make or provide patient organizations with stable incomes for, so as to say, operational um, costs because it is really exhausting to be able to having having to look for operational costs of your office every year and concentrate on on the work at hand that you have so um, I should probably mention that that last November an umbrella patient organization was mentioned uh, was formed and um, the funding issue is part uh, of its strategy, part of its priorities. We are doing all we can to help create a viable system for patient organizations to do a good work, good job. And as for the policymakers relationship, I, I dare to say that for the last 10 years, of at least existence of our umbrella rare disease uh, organization, we, we feel we are accepted as um, respected partners and we are partaking in negotiations, which is, which is something that we need to promote the well being of our patients. Thank you. Th thanks so much, Anna. That's that's a lot. That's a lot you've just brought on the uh, indeed uh, the definition, professionalizations, better advocate, 
um, this funding that you're exploring, sort of a tool to have stable funding. Uh, it sounds like the, the landscape has tremendously uh, improved in Czech Republic. I'm sure there's still a lot to be done. Because we've talked and mentioned a few times the uh, legislation that has been adopted in, uh, in the Czech Republic, I'd like to come back to it. And because we have here, you know, a, a former uh, representative of the industry, uh, the doctor, uh, and, and, and someone that is really involved with the patient community, I'd like to hear from from you three maybe on the you know like this legislation. What has been brought by this legislation that was not there before? What are the key for you, the key changes? And I know it's a bit early, right? But if there's already some signs of you know like changes and improvements, what are these? So who would like to start? Anna? Anna, please go ahead. I know a few of you have worked heavily on this uh, legislation, so I'm sure you have a, a pretty good understanding of uh, of what it uh, entails. Please yes. go ahead. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I have, a, I have a little bit of a speech handicap, so I was trying to suck on a lozenge. <laughs> anyway, yes, the legislation, um, it took a few years to actually prepare it. Um, Jakub may help me when we started. It was, I think, 2017, right when the patient council was formed. So we already, as patients, took part in the working group of the ministry where all the stakeholders were present. And it, it was a very interesting discussion on how can we do it so that all the orphan drugs can actually enter the reimbursement system uh, without uh, really ev being evaluated only according to the price. So soft uh, criteria came to, uh, came to discussion and it became also part of the legislation. Um, uh, the actual legislation was prepared as part of the uh, three ways that um, um, the uh, authorization holders can use in our country. Um, so it's not the only way they can use. They can decide to go uh, through the already traditional way of reimbursement request. So um, in 2019, I think the legislation was ready, but the COVID hit and there were totally different uh, uh, things that we had to go through in the parliament and in the Senate. Um, uh, it almost looked like we were not gonna approve it. It took us a lot of advocacy work as patients that this um, <coughs> legislation um, uh, was approved. Um, it's actually funny because this legislation was a huge, um, it wasn't only orphan drugs, it was um, other changes, other really important changes, but we as patients, because we, we as rare disease patients were fighting for the approval of it, it slowly became the orphan drug legislation change, which was really nice. But we managed, together with the help of politicians, to uh, have it approved on uh, September 14th. So it's effective as of January 1. Uh, everyone was thinking that the moment it came into force, um, the, of, um, the pharmaceutical companies would attack it and start filing requests. However, um, uh, the requests only started coming in very slowly at the moment. We have five of them on the table. And I think that um, everybody's kind of waiting how the first one will do, and to, which I understand, but I'm sure that it will slowly start moving ahead. But let Anna, me talk. Can I ask you, why would pharma companies file against this legislation? Can you explain us why? Not file against, file for the request. Okay, okay, okay. sorry. That part of the decision making process is uh, our patients and experts. And uh, this decision making process is has two levels. The first level is the evaluation. <clears throat> where after the, the filing of the request for reimbursement, uh, patients and experts file their statements. 
And then after the regulator comes out with a um, evaluation report, then there is a special body at the ministry, uh, it's called advisory body, that has four parts, four member parts. It's the ministry, which is the state. It is the payers, the insurance companies, and then again, patients and experts. And this uh, advisory body makes the final recommendation to the minister to either reimburse or not reimburse or reimburse with proposals of change. So we're still waiting for the first uh, advisory body to take place and hoping that uh, the uh, pharmaceutical companies start filing more. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks a lot for explaining the, the two-step approach and this very collegial advisory body that is going to also be involved in there. Uh, Pavla, Jakub, would you like to add any uh, any elements there? Pavla, please go ahead. I mean, from the physician's point of view, I see the legislation changes from slightly different perspective because what I perceive are the problems associated with the interpretation of the legislation and implementation. And of course, we have to face extreme, um, extreme spectrum of rare diseases for which very different drugs have not only different prices, but they have very different efficacy. And that's the major point, is saving the life of a child who will remain bed bound with very, very little quality of life. Is it worth paying or not? And so there are many ethical issues associated with the legislation which cannot be covered by the law. So I see much, much uh, of a problem in the future, but it is necessary to, to do these steps. And we also have to keep in mind that only minority of rare diseases at the moment have uh, really effective drugs available. So it's not just uh, the orphan treatment which needs to be available, but the spectrum of other drugs which may not be orphans but maybe drugs that are used for different indications as well, maybe expensive as well, which need to be available and there are associated with the costs which have to be taken into account. So uh, I see the problem um, much, much wider. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jakob. Would you like to add anything there? Maybe just a uh, just few, few comments. Uh, of course, uh, it's not uh, to allow all the all the drugs to come to the patients. Yeah, it's only the those you know who are let's say really the benefit for them. And uh, uh, what was mentioned here, this this committee is uh, also established jointly with uh, payers, with the Ministry of Health, and of course you know the 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 reasoning is to have uh, the real public interest. And sometimes you know the public interest is not to pay for everything. So. It's definitely good to mention it that, uh, that this system needs to prove itself uh, efficient based on the, based on the, the patient view and uh, to have also the, the social perspective uh, inside. But on the other hand, it also needs to prove to be to be good enough to make the system stable. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's fair to mention it. Uh, and we believe, you know, that the system itself also makes uh, the negotiation between the the marketing authorization holder and payer. Uh, the part of uh, preparation process uh, and uh, it will make the work of the committee quite easy, uh, hopefully. But everything new, I mean, has, uh, has uh, to prove its, uh, its, uh, its value. And uh, uh, now we've been struggling you know, with a uh, number of companies you know, to, uh, to, uh, to file the, the, the proposals. Uh, and you can mention it five or six of them. I believe it will it will become it will become more than more soon. On the other hand, it's also good to say that uh, that uh, uh, what needs to be carefully maintained is the is the data, and the part of the system is also the review after the year of, uh, of existence uh, at the Czech market. So so we will also have to be uh, precise in reviewing you know all those uh, new therapies coming to ensure that the budget is stable and. Uh, we have uh, we have a good funding also for the for the other therapeutic areas, but uh, it's only one one chance you know how to get to the Czech system. You have um, a very special pathway, one more, 
uh, temporary reimbursement, uh, where if you are considered to be really innovative treatment, then you can get uh, up to five years of temporary reimbursement. So the time you can get your real world evidence is quite quite long, and uh, there is not need to be the the rare. So uh, it's also the pathway which works uh, quite well, I believe. And then uh, the extraordinary reimbursement based on the individual approval of the of the payer funds, and that's make it quite a good combination of different uh, chances to get inside the system. So uh, currently, I mean, we are not very strong uh, uh, European economy, but we have uh, we are on the I believe the number eleven in the Europe on the access to uh, to rare disease treatment, which it's quite quite good to to uh, to compare about uh, how much we invest, you know, to the the treatment itself. Well, thanks a lot, Jakub. I'm turning to you, Leona. I wondered, uh, has Sobi already uh, tried this new system? Are you forcing to uh, try it? What's your view uh, as a, as a, as a mid-sized pharmaceutical company? I would uh, just uh, say not yet, but definitely I can promise that, uh, that uh, we will come very soon with uh, one our drug approved and uh, with our fund designation. So definitely we would like to go this way. Thank you very much, Leona. So Jakub, you will keep us posted in a couple of months. Uh, I'm sure uh, that uh, we will see you as uh, the number six or seven uh, company filling then. Uh, hopefully for a, a successful uh, uh, success, very successful application, Leona. Uh, I'm just, I just wanted to 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 bring back a little bit the uh, because I, we see this legislation clearly aims to tackle the, the the access questions, and it's a it's a national legislation. So I'm sure there's some learnings for for the European Union there. But Jakub, I'd like to understand also from you how do you see you know the um, the, the the access questions being deb debated at EU level? As you know, like there has been a for years now uh, debates about you know the legislation and what can be done at EU level. Um, do you do you think that the EU is best placed to tackle access questions uh, thanks to its existing competency, which we know are rather limited when it comes to uh, health? What's your view there, um, especially with uh, with regard to you know the, the revision of the legislation in the OMP and, and pharmaceutical legislation? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I mean, we are on the edge of. Uh, of uh, of a big change in the in the in the Europe, and uh, I mean, if you if you take for example the European Health Data Space, it's uh, it's uh, the legislation which will change the environment of healthcare in uh, in all European countries, and uh, it will be not anymore the the agenda of uh, individual member states. So I mean, based on the the access to data, I mean, for primary use uh, for the for the healthcare specialist, but also for the patient. And then the secondary use, you know, for the for the for the research, for planning, for uh, let's say coping with a uh, number of uh, of, uh, of epidemics. I mean, it brings, you know, it will bring, it will, it will really, you know, change the the whole environment. And uh, the last two years shows, you know, that the Europe cannot uh, really leave the 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 healthcare to be, let's say, only the the agenda of member states. And uh, if works, you know, for the vaccines, it works, you know, for the uh, antiviral, anti, antiviral treatment, why not to, 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 to come together, you know, to talk about, uh, to talk about uh, the rare disease treatment and access to, to, uh, to the treatment all in the European countries. Again, if you take the, the oncology, oncology plan, European Beating Cancer Plan, again, it tries to, to, to have similar uh, access to treatment screening uh, to all the other areas uh, which are the part of care to, to patients uh, to the very, very similar level in all European countries. So, I mean, now, until now, we had the feeling that the, the healthcare is uh, really the individual member states agenda uh, with very different way of uh, insurance, very different way of uh, reimbursement. Uh, but, I mean, it's natural that uh, this will have to become more and more united and especially if we take the area of rare, I mean, this is this is something you know what cannot be dealt uh, dealt by the small uh, European member states. Of course, I mean, if you take uh, the countries like Germany or France, then uh, in, in the number of uh, inhabitants, then I mean, it makes sense to build uh, to build a very very robust uh, 
uh, system of care, but in countries with less than five, two million, uh, doesn't make sense really to invest, you know, to have, uh, let's say the treatment centers for, for every disease, you know, I mean, from all that area of, of rare diseases, for example. So, I mean, we have to build uh, this, uh, this network of, uh, of uh, centers. We have to continue to really share, you know, the capacities and it will, it, will, it will be necessary then also to share the way, you know, how we pay for the treatment and to somehow make closer the, 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 the investment in this field. It will be not easy, it will take a long time, but I believe that in 10 year, 10 year time, it will be a very different map of Europe uh, from the perspective of uh, available care. I hope so. I hope so, because this is something, you know, what, uh, what, uh, what uh, will, let's say, really maintain the access and, uh, and the people will, will have to probably travel a bit to, to get the, the best possible care. But it's, a, it's, it's, it's natural, yeah? It's not possible to have a uh, treatment for ultra rare, uh, ultra rare uh, cancer, for example, uh, in every hospital around the Europe. We will have to have uh, very specialized uh, places to provide this care. And also the, the, the level and number of uh, professionals who are trained and who are really you know, on that level to be able to provide this kind of care is limited. And we have to invest you know, to those people a lot of, uh, lot of energy and finances and uh, uh, then we will have to share it. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Jakub. I think, and, and that liaises perfectly with uh, what I wanted to ask you, uh, Pavla. Uh, there has been a lot, uh, you know, going on also on the policy side, not just the legislation on OMP, but also, you know, the European reference networks, for example, you know, have been a flagship in the in that space uh, set up by DG Santé, funded and, and refunded and now being expanded. So, you know, these networks aim to bring the best experts across Europe uh, to tackle certain diseases, and you're a member of them. Uh, there's also the EU Health, uh, EU for Health program that has now some dedicated actions that are meant to also complement what the what the, the ERN are meant to do. So, could you tell us a little bit about these two actions? You know, the European Reference Networks, EU for Health, and also I'd like to broaden it and maybe Anna, you could give us some perspective there because you mentioned Jakob that the, the, one of the big challenges is also treating patients, right? And there's no point having you know best. Uh, 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 centers, excellent centers in every country. So what do we do with patients? How do we make them cross borders? And how do we then ensure, you know, reimbursement? And then there's, of course, all the, you know, the the, 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 the challenges of, you know, language barrier, you know, like relocation, if the treatment is long, etc. So so could you explain us a little bit, Pavla, how you see that first, maybe from the, the an EU perspective, the, these programs, and, and then the patient perspective, how do we how do we tackle the cross-border treatment? So you mentioned two two groups of problems, but in fact, there are more of them because the number one problem for sure, not only in the Czech Republic, but also in many other European countries, is the fact that we do not know the exact numbers of the patients with various rare diseases. So this is not known. We don't know what, which percentage of them actually has already been diagnosed, where they are moving around, which part of the healthcare, because just the part of them actually do reach the centers of excellence, which exist in, in particular countries. So actually having this um, data available is number one, which is absolutely inevitable. And on the national level, there are now actions that really should lead to that we are trying hard to create the national registry of rare diseases that would cover all rare diseases with just basic data plus the proper diagnosis which will be number one information for both healthcare organizers as well as payers so this is this is definitely number one and the uh, the level of this information differs among different countries because some of the countries like France or Spain or Italy just a few of them do have all Already, their national registries in place. But the other countries have specific disease registries, maybe national or institutional, or even contribute to international. But these are for certain diseases only. But we are lacking something that would cover the whole spectrum. So this is number one of a problem. In terms of the uh, ERNs, like European uh, reference networks, uh, this is a fantastic idea. The major idea behind that in terms of the healthcare is actually to utilize the expertise which may exist in some of the countries and to actually uh, altruistically use it for the countries which are under-resourced 
not only in terms, in monetary terms, but also in the expertise terms. So this is the, the major idea behind that. But of course, it comes with many of problems because in fact, you can hardly be reimbursed for the consultation that you provide to the patient who is being cared for in a different country. But that's just a minor problem. So there are many problems associated with, um, you know, with the CPMS system, which is the consultation system, which has been well established and the platform for it has been uh, working for a couple of years already, although uh, differently uh, in a different extent and quality in different groups of diseases. But I think the major problem in majority of countries lies in the, the way how the care for rare patients is actually being organized because it's not only the top expert centers, uh, their uh, personnel and the way how they can um, sustain for the future because majority of these places actually really have a couple of um, elderly experts and not only in the Czech Republic but also in other countries there is a major problem in newcomers in junior physicians being interested in this extremely difficult area where you just can't stop working when you're working hours stop uh, it's just not compatible and the new generation of physicians maybe not only physicians the new generation looks at from the different perspective to their life values. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. I'm not judging it. I'm just saying it is like that and we have to work with it and we have to deal with it. So that's another group of problems that obviously health, healthcare system is not only those expert centers, it's a network of different levels of healthcare and they all need to treat uh, and deal with um, uh, rare disease patients. Even the primary care a physician has to know what uh, level of decisions he or she can make if the rare disease patient uh, gets common flu or just running nose or whatever injuries. So these are all problems which have to be thought of. And, and there is a long path in front of us because this will not be uh, generalizable across all those diseases. Although we believe that some points will be generalizable. So we are thinking of creating the generic uh, standards for rare disease patients in terms of the organization of healthcare, and this is actually also one of the points for the uh, for the EU for Health project, which you mentioned on the European level, uh, which should mainly deal with the integration of rare disease care, especially those expert centers into the national healthcare systems. But it counts with uh, creating the networks not only those top centers, but also the lower levels of centers and down to the, uh, down to the primary care and actually uh, joining it with a social care system as well, because it's not just healthcare, yeah. which is required for those patients. Uh, and and who, who does that? Who should do that, Pavla? Is it a, a national level? Is it an EU? Is it combined? Do you, do you need a, EU for health budget for that? Or is it like that's a, a good recovery question. fund? Actually, EU, um, EU for health actually provides uh, a budget for the consortium, which will be created by the member states who will be interested in contributing to creating this, uh, uh, this kind of roadmap. How to, where should we go and how we might go for that for the national, for the individual national healthcare systems and individual countries will then either learn from it, get bits and pieces or um, actually um, um, amend it to their needs, modify it, or they don't. And because there is nobody from the EU level who can make the orders to the national healthcare system. Sometimes I think it is, um, I'm sorry for that. Sometimes it's probably a good thing. So finding the balance between the centralization within Europe and freedom of individual countries. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for the policymakers that they have to make those decisions. Thanks, thanks, Pavla, for the very honest answer. Anna, what does it look like for patients to cross borders? Can you, I mean, concretely, do you see some things improving there, you know, and 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 basically how it is day to day to to, to you know to manage your care or to be treated when you're a rare disease patient and you don't have access to a treatment, but also maybe to just the specialist that can uh, diagnose you or treat you uh, when you have a rare disease in in, in Czech Republic. Thank you for this question. Uh, it is. Um... 
how should I say? We have a cross-border directive, thank God, because within cross-border directive, ERNs were formed. Um, that's why we have it. That's why we want uh, to use the expertise that cannot be found for this ultra rare disease, maybe only in Austria. So the patient has to go to Austria. Uh, it's a fantastic idea, but there are big obstacles for the patient, him or herself. First of all, the the patient has to be well spoken in uh, uh, foreign languages. Has to be a good um, uh, uh, um, uh, has to has to know how to write letters, <laughs> how to communicate with experts abroad uh, to be able to find the care. On top of that, in Czech Republic, you can uh, apply for um, um, care or some kind of treatment uh, abroad, but it, it has to be filed in advance um, based on a so-called so exception paragraph or paragraph 16, we call it, um, but which may or may not be approved. Um, so the, the actual process of getting to uh, a help abroad is extremely demanding for the patient and its family. So we have still ways to go to improve the cross-border healthcare directive. Um, as you may know, we have, uh, we, have uh, we are on the path, pathway to a, a revision. Um, we as patient have come up with proposals of, um, um, you know, possible ways to change that. However, however, it is still a big problem for those ultra rare uh, patients to access the care. Thanks, Anna. And so, I mean, we see some of these challenges clearly. I mean, you know, of course, some improvements, and we hope the legislation has a has a great impact. But indeed, like you've highlighted, I think both very well some of the current challenges, which also take place at uh, at national level. Leona, I'm turning to you because I would be very interested also to hear from you. And you know, what do you think are the biggest challenge or the biggest obstacles? For you know, mid-sized company like like Sobi, when it comes to uh, rare disease, when it comes to you know the research, the development, the distribution, what's what's the biggest bottleneck in, in your view? Yeah, uh, as 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 we know, there are, there are old months, almost uh, seven, I would say seven thousand rare diseases. Yeah, and uh, company of size uh, of size size of Sobi, uh, let's say, has to uh, has to somehow prioritize uh, where uh, where uh, to focus in order, uh, let's say, to deliver treatments to the patients uh, and remain somehow, let's say, financially stable. I would say uh, we need to take into consideration the small size, uh, small size of the uh, rare diseases, uh, patient size, uh, and uh, with considerable, considerable, I would say, scientific, uh, scientific risk and um, and um, uh, high failure, uh, high failure, uh, let's say, chance. Yeah. So I would say the decision, decision to invest in de developing uh, the new treatment is therefore very, uh, very uh, complex one and uh, still with high degree of, uh, of, of the failure, yeah, of un uncertainty. And I would say that today's uh, investment uh, is uh, deeply sensitive uh, to, to payers' uh, willingness, uh, willingness to pay. Also, uh, there is need to consider, uh, let's say, uh, reflection, the uh, evolving uh, incentive framework. It means, let's say, these uh, changes in, in uh, payer uh, or regulatory policy, and also, let's say, uh, market factors. Yeah, and uh, this is one level. Another level is uh, that, that uh, therapies is proven. We have, uh, we have the data. And um, and then there is much larger uh, or or uh, much uh, sometimes uh, difficult uh, let's say task uh, to to have this uh, therapy uh, reimbursed yeah so then there are more aspects uh, uh, which let's say come into play 
and are needed to be agreed uh, by uh, by stakeholders. It's, it means sufficiency and uh, enough uh, enough data from clinical programs, then uh, cost of treatment, knowing that this part is really, let's say, uh, small uh, in 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 words of uh, patient size. Uh, and we somehow, let's say, think that there is, uh, and what already, let's say, was mentioned, that, that there is some uh, part that uh, that uh, patients are uh, are uh, are visible in the system, and the, versus uh, the part the patients are somehow, let's say, misdiagnosed and maybe inadequately, uh, let's say, treated, and uh, then. Uh, also, let's say the pricing uh, system, uh, where we need to take into consideration IRP. It means uh, it means international referencing uh, price system, and also let's say another uh, price price uh, adjustment uh, uh, required on country level, uh, based, for example. Uh, comparison with the comparison with uh, with uh, I would say. Uh, obsolete or just symptomatic non-causal uh, causal treatment. And uh, also, last but not least, general, uh, let's say, cost effectiveness uh, models uh, not reflecting our fund specificity. Thanks a lot, Leona. So challenges also, just like well before uh, a drug reach uh, potentially uh, uh, patients, right? So it's not just about the the access, the the diagnosis, the treatment, uh, uh, but also very much in the development of of, of new medicines. Um, um, so I mean, that's that's bring me back to to you, Jacob. I wanted to ask you because we see now in the current debates on the pharmaceutical legislation and also the OMP, uh, the orphan uh, drug legislation, there's uh, you know greater uh, uh, great debates around you know uh, the notion of unmet medical needs and for orphan of high unmet medical needs. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on these notions? Uh, uh, as I'm sure you, you've heard a little bit about, you know, the current discussions on these. And also, we'd be very interested to understand what's the, you know, like um, the, the overall European dynamics when it comes to country positions on these revisions. Is there, you know, like a common shared view uh, on the revision? Uh, or there are there some differences between, you know, those countries that have maybe greater access versus those that, that, that don't have uh, that, that good access to especially orphan disease? Okay, just very briefly, uh, the the overall discussion is is ongoing. And uh, but what I can what I can what I can summarize is that we can see a quite a strong solidarity from the big uh, countries like France or Germany uh, to help the, the small countries to get uh, to get faster to get faster access to the treatment which uh, they require for their for their for their patient. So there will be definitely a very strong discussion uh, how to how to create uh, the regulatory or natural environment to uh, to uh, make the launch much faster than it was uh, than it was in the past. Uh, we can see, and you already mentioned it, uh, uh, let's say very very intensive discussion about the unmet medical need and how to. How to ensure, how to connect, you know, the the support for the for the R and D investment uh, uh, in connection with unmet medical need, and uh, how to create again the environment which will be which will be interesting for pharmaceutical companies, but also for the for the academies. And uh, uh, but this discussion is definitely not at the end, and we can see that uh, that uh, especially the definition, uh, the connection with timing. So it's mean how to invest in our medical need, uh, and then and then uh, how how to to ensure that in uh, in the time where the outcomes you know to uh, are available, that it's still you know the unmet medical need and so on. There is there is there is ongoing discussion. It's difficult to say you know how it will finish. We still have uh, we still have uh, space. It's coming on the on the on the level of uh, national states experts. But it's also it's also run based uh, on on the on the level of uh, of scientific advisors and uh, the external experts. So uh, we will have to wait a bit to to see you know what will be what will be final draft of the text. 
And you know, the final, I mean, the draft is draft and the discussion will then continue, you know, within the, within the member states and experts uh, on, the, on the committees. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, will be, it will be still a quite, uh, quite a long process, but I hope uh, we will get a chance to, uh, to, uh, to have this new pharmaceutical environment uh, very soon. I mean, it will be definitely not the, the, during the Czech presidency, but, uh, but uh, uh, hopefully not uh, no too long uh, after we finish our task. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Jakub. So lots, mm -hmm. uh, lots to be still uh, yet defined on this unmet medical need. Obviously, that's a critical point of the review, right? Because, uh, yeah. you know, how broad the definition would look like or not and what kind of incentives would be connected to this definition is, is critical for the industry because that means also in terms of investments, you know, potentially shifting some investments to other uh, areas. So, so obviously, uh, that's, that is, that is very key. And I wanted to turn to you because, you know, on this very point, you know, uh, uh, last week, FPI and Eurodis came together and uh, have issued a, a, a joint position, also in very strong, strongly connected to the pharmaceutical uh, legislation revision. So uh, I wanted to give you the floor here to explain us a little bit, you know, how Eurodis and FPI, uh, you know, uh, see some, you know, uh, commonalities in terms of, you know, uh, how the reform could address the needs of patients and also meet the uh, innovation objectives of the, uh, of the pharmaceutical industry. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, this discussion has been going on for a year and a half almost, and this is the, the first um, joint statement after 25 years of existence of Eurodis. So we, um, uh, <clears throat> we really value uh, this joint statement and uh, uh, now you caught me by surprise because I still have to learn all the outcomes, but in general, we really would like to have more transparent um, approach to uh, uh, access, um, uh, specifically in the area of um, uh, the having for the countries uh, would unite in a access of um, or approach to filing within two years of receiving the registration. We think, well, some think it might be even sooner. Um, the joint statement says two years. Also, there should be a platform where we could uh, visibly see where uh, who filed in which um, yeah in which state there is, um, um, the procedure is for reimbursement. And so, so we could see it. Uh -huh. um, and, and if I can also <clears throat> add, and now indeed there's also this notion of tier, uh, tier, tiers based pricing that has been introduced, um, which I think is also an important element there. Jakob, you seem uh, to be hesitant there. Uh, <laughs> could, you, could you tell us a little bit what your thoughts are on this? Uh, job, no, uh, no, I, it's, uh, it's, it's about the, not, not about the hesitance, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I read the material. It's definitely interesting to see, you know, I, mean, I know how it is difficult, you know, for the industry to find the joint position between the companies and then even, you know, to find the joint position, you know, with, uh, with patient organizations. Yeah, so it's definitely, definitely very, very, I mean, big task to do all that work. If you ask me if this could work, I don't think so. There will be two years. So it will have to look probably a bit different than 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 is this proposal. Uh, and I mean, uh, it's a it's not it's a it's voluntary platform. Let's say showing you know when and some kind of basic uh, basic uh, uh, information you know if the company will launch or not and where. Uh, two-year time and not mandatory, I don't think so. It will really help, you know, and, and to be honest, you know, the, the, the FPA only covers the part of the industry, you know, and how the rest of the companies will, will, will join it on a voluntary basis. <laughs> you know, and I, I am hesitant because, you know, we did it, you know, a number of attempts, you know, to do the something similar here and it never really works. So uh, good luck with that. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely, you know, worth to try. And with the tier pricing, 
all the countries will have to abandon the 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 fully established referencing uh, referencing system to have uh, the tier pricing yeah. uh, possible for implementation it's possible of course everything is possible miracles are happening but uh, you know do you think that the really the states will 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 just you know let all the all the all the uh, uh, let's say systems and we'll just go for tier pricing no so how we will keep the tier pricing you know in the, in two levels uh, no no I mean it's 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 good that there is the there is the there is the intention to come with uh, the basic with some kind of proposal but uh, uh, it will probably look a bit different the environment than it is in this uh, in this material but maybe I'm wrong who am I to 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 really say you know if it is if it is really really you know I mean worse of uh, of, of uh, further development or not. I mean, thanks very much, Yaku, for the very uh, straight and honest feedback. I think, indeed, as you said, you know, it's the it's the first time they come together with a joint statement. So maybe a, a first step, which is indeed a positive uh, progress, but probably a, a long way to go. And as you said rightly, uh, you know, it's just the kickoff of the negotiations when the file will come. There will be, of course, you know, debates and possible changes to the EU proposal. But I mean, we're not we're not yet there, indeed. But uh, that's that's indeed a, a an important consideration. I, I wanted to to ask you, Jacob, you know, and also Leona, in terms of you know uh, innovation and R and D, how how can we, you know, improve the, uh, the the landscape in Europe? We see a lot of, you know, small and mid-sized biotech companies that, you know, uh, are developed in Europe, uh, scale a little bit up in Europe, but then they move to the US. And to your point uh, of competency, Pavla, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the lack or the challenges with, you know, having the right physicians uh, also in, in the member states in Europe, uh, how, how are we going to cope with that? So how do we keep innovation happening in Europe versus uh, in the US? West, which you've seen a lot in the last years, um, and how can the EU best address that in your view? Who would you like to start? Leona, maybe. Okay, uh, thank you for this question. It's, uh, and uh, and uh, let's say also mentioning this previous discussion, I, I think that's uh, really, really uh, complex, uh, complex uh, uh, issue, I would say. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, Jakub, that that uh, uh, just just to somehow uh, somehow stick to uh, IRP, for example, and everybody, let's say, uh, will accept uh, it definitely. Uh, currently, doesn't work, and uh, and we will see. And uh, it it means that that we will need, uh, let's say, more time, and uh, I would say many uh, many discussions to to fix it uh, and to find the, the common solution. I would say. And uh, let's say uh, from from uh, EU uh, legislative bar, I would say that that our belief is uh, on the appropriate incentive uh, with creation broad uh, regulatory framework, yeah, broad criteria for defining these unmet needs, and I uh, would mention also uh, sufficiently tailored, uh, let's say, measures versus. Uh, let's say one size fits all solution, which is I would say in, inappropriate inappropriate in in this in this area. And by knowing that that still ninety five percent of rare diseases are without the approved uh, approved treatment, yeah. Uh, so so we clearly know that that let's say without such policies uh, in place, uh, the interest of uh, the developers. Uh, to invest in these areas, uh, let's say, would be much, much, uh, much lower. Yeah. So, and I would say on uh, on pair level, uh, it will require different approach from 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 pair uh, in long term, uh, considering factors uh, associated with rare disease uh, uh, therapies. It means rarity of the condition, disease severity, let's say av availability also uh, of existing treatment and societal burden, which is already somehow, let's say, involve, uh, involved into, into this Czech -like legislation. And uh, what else? And uh, we know that there is relative absence of information about uh, condition, uh, about the conditions. And uh, let's say it raises a need uh, to involve 
uh, to involve uh, these uh, these specific experts experts thank, here. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Leona. We're reaching the end of this uh, of this roundtable. I'd like to very briefly hand over to Vittoria for closing remarks. I know some of you have to leave soon, so uh, thank you very much again for your participation. And Victoria, uh, handing over to you for the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Antoine, and thank you everybody for uh, for joining us today. In fact, it was a really interesting and rich conversation. And for the objective that we had at the beginning to really find that interplay between uh, uh, national uh, European level, I think that we really got a lot of food for for thoughts. Uh, we we heard the perspective of uh, uh, healthcare professionals and really understanding the difficulties is there with uh, uh, having expertise in country, having resources and centers and keeping them there and even understanding where the patients are and how to, you know, uh, having that precondition, which is the presence of data. Uh, we heard the perspective of uh, uh, mid-sized companies but that have this uh, uh, really big task of uh, uh, navigating a system where the value assessment framework is not necessarily up to speed with the complexity of uh, orphan therapies. And, uh, and finally, we have, of course, the, uh, the access issue, which all the stakeholders are interested in solving, really, including, obviously, us. And, um, and I would say that a lot of what we're doing shows this complementarity, but also things that can be done at national level. It's music to our ears to hear that the Czech Republic presidency will focus further on the rare disease plan. We support fully uh, the work that Eurodis has been doing, and we have worked with them as well a lot on, uh, on these topics. And we will have the health data space that can certainly help in this uh, um, in this sense, looking forward to the review and hoping that all this piece of the puzzle will also be taken into account to have a balanced uh, um, outcome for also the incentive part, which are a key of this life cycle approach in our opinion. So this is uh, this will be for me the, the wrap up of this session. Hopefully I gave justice to all of these uh, amazing uh, com um, comments that we received. And, uh, and, uh, and and thank you all for your participation. Sorry, we couldn't have quite, uh, time for the Q and A, but and I see many questions in the. Uh, and in we the... will make sure to answer to all these questions uh, as a follow up. Thank thanks you. very much, Victoria. Thanks everyone for joining and for your different contributions. I wish you an excellent day, and uh, for sure we'll be in touch again on these topics, on these very topics in the coming weeks and months uh, with the upcoming EU proposals. Uh, thanks and have an excellent day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.